Hi, this is Kendall Boyson, professional life and recovery coach, and you're listening to Encouragementology, the practice of instilling hope. Hi there. Thanks for joining me. On this show, we are examining the pendulum swing, going from happy to hopeless and back. This swing could play out over a lifetime, or it could feel like it happens in an instant, over and over. Emotions are tricky and unique to you. We aren't talking what is normal. We're talking about what's going on with you or someone you know. The good thing about the swing is that it will come around again. So in some cases, it's about weathering the storm, reaching out for support and comfort, and trusting in your ability to right the ship. Ultimately, you have the power over your thoughts and reactions. And even when it feels like you've lost all control and your emotional roller coaster is taking too long in the dips, you still have options. Just recognizing that this isn't the way you want to live in the first place is the first step. On this show, we'll talk through the others. So, ready to throw up your hands and embrace the ride? So let's check in with ourselves and be honest. How fast does your pendulum swing? Today we're talking about happy to hopeless, but you might find calm to anxious, sweet to sour, agreeable to angry. You fill in the blanks. Your emotions are anything but even keel, calm or consistent. All those highs and lows have left you wondering what the heck is going on and why you feel like a mess. Must be the way you're wired, right? Something you learned from the people who demonstrated that kind of behavior first or as a result of someone or something. Or have you ever taken the time to do a self-evaluation on your journey to self-discovery? Maybe you're only on mile marker one and this is all new to you. Most of us accept and justify our own behavior blaming others or promise to work on it someday. Or better yet, claim to be working on it now without a clue as to why or how. As a result, one minute, you're on top of the world loving life and the next thing you know, nothing is going right or ever will. Is this your own private hell? Or are you inviting others on this crazy ride? You know that person that's bouncing off the rails and you're so happy for them, celebrating and praising for a job well done. And then the next time you see them, clouds over their head, woe is me, the sky is falling. (sighs) That can be exhausting. My guess is that person has probably been avoided since everyone knows their moods can be so volatile. How are you doing is just a polite greeting in some cases. Whether you have a picture of someone in your mind as I'm describing this behavior or you're shaking your head coming to the realization that this might be you, let's chat. There is an understanding to be had responsibility to be claimed, and new ideas to embrace. To be clear, I am in no way making light of depression or acting as if choosing happy is the answer. Hopefully, we'll touch on all the points to give you some new insight. But if you're listening and feeling hopeless and unable to find your way out, please reach out. There are resources that will help you get through this dark time in your life. So don't suffer in silence. Maybe this is a new and confusing time in your life, and you're still trying to figure out what you're dealing with. Jennifer Berry helps clarify with common symptoms of depression, what to know, in her article for medicalnewstoday.com. Everyone experiences feelings of sadness occasionally, but depression is different. It persists over time and can cause a variety of other symptoms. Depression is a medical condition that affects more than 300 million people globally. 
according to the World Health Organization. People sometimes call it clinical depression or major depressive disorder. There are several different types of depression, and the symptoms vary among individuals. While anyone can experience some of these symptoms from time to time, a doctor will only diagnose depression when a certain cluster of symptoms appear, and they persist for more than two weeks or longer. Number one, feeling sad or empty. Mood changes are one of the most common symptoms of depression. A person who has depression may feel sad or down for long periods of time. They may also say that they feel empty or unable to feel joy or happiness. Some people may describe this sadness as despair. Number two, feeling hopeless or helpless. Depression can make people feel hopeless, as though there is no foreseeable end to how they're feeling. A person may also feel helpless. They may say or think that no one can help them get better or that they will always feel depressed. Number three, feeling worthless. A person who has depression may feel that they are worthless and have no meaning in their life. They may believe that they are a burden to others or that the world or their family might be better off without them. Number four, feeling excessively guilty. Guilt is a normal reaction after a person says or does something they regret. But people with depression may have ongoing feelings of guilt that are inappropriate or disproportionate to their situation. They may focus a lot of energy on this guilt and feel bad about themselves and the things that they have said or done, even events that have long since passed. Number five, no interest or pleasure in activities. Some people with depression lose interest in things that they used to enjoy, such as sports, going out with friends, music, or sexual activity. They may turn down offers or opportunities to do activities or be with others. Number six, anger or irritability. A person with depression may seem to be angry with others. They may become easily annoyed or irritated. The National Institutes of Mental Health state that men are more likely than women to experience irritability and anger as symptoms of depression. However, these symptoms may also occur in women and children. Irritability also has links to other symptoms of depression. For example, if a person is not sleeping well or feels tired, they may be prone to irritability. Number seven, feeling tired and a loss of energy. Some people with depression may find it difficult to get up in the morning because they feel exhausted and run down. They may feel too fatigued to do everyday tasks, such as going to work or cooking meals. They may spend a lot of time at home resting or sleeping. The fatigue of depression can make a person feel as though they are always tired, despite getting enough sleep at night. However, others with depression do experience poor sleep. Number eight, insomnia or lack of sleep. According to 2008 research, about 75% of people with depression experience symptoms of insomnia. Sometimes a person with depression may be unable to sleep well, potentially having trouble either falling asleep or staying asleep. They may stay up very late at night or wake up very early in the morning. Number nine, difficulty concentrating, remembering, and making decisions. A person with depression may experience many mood changes. Depression can interfere with a person's cognitive abilities. They may have trouble focusing or concentrating on personal or professional matters. They may also struggle to make decisions, including small everyday choices. People with depression may also find that they cannot remember things as well as they did previously. They may forget appointments or commitments, and they may not recall things as they were said or what they did recently. Number 10, lack of appetite. People with depression may lose their desire and appetite for food, which can cause weight loss. They may have little interest in eating or go for long periods of time without food. 
Number 11, overeating and weight gain. Some people may eat more when they're depressed. Food can become a comfort mechanism for negative feelings or a way to deal with boredom or being alone. Depression can make it difficult for people to feel motivated to get outside or to exercise. Combined with an increase of food intake, this can lead to weight gain. Number 12, aches, pains, and physical symptoms. A person with depression may experience persistent physical symptoms that do not respond to treatment. These can include headaches, digestive disorders, unexplained aches and pains. Number 13, thoughts of death or suicide. A person with depression may think about death and dying. They may also think about suicide and how they could end their life. These thoughts are called suicidal ideation. Sometimes a person may tell others about these thoughts. If someone is talking about death or suicide, this may be their way of asking for help, and it's vital to seek assistance. In severe cases of depression, a person may hurt themselves or self-harm. Depression is a common but serious condition that can be life-threatening. Not every person who thinks about suicide will attempt it. However, if someone mentions suicide, either contact a doctor or help them seek urgent medical care. If you know of someone at immediate risk of self-harm, suicide, or hurting another person, call 911 or the local emergency number. Stay with the person until professional help arrives. Remove any weapons, medications, or other potential harmful objects. Listen to the person without judgment. If you or someone you know is having thoughts of suicide, a prevention hotline can help. The National Suicide Prevention Line is available 24 hours a day at 1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-8255. Having one of these symptoms does not mean that a person has depression. For instance, other health issues and some medications can cause weight gain or insomnia. People who have one or more of these symptoms and are concerned about depression should speak to a doctor. According to the American Psychiatric Association, a person who has depression will have several of the symptoms I've mentioned for longer than two weeks. There is no single test that can diagnose depression. Usually, a medical professional will evaluate a person's symptoms, family history, and medical history to make a diagnosis. They may also use specialized questionnaires and screening tools. Many people with depression use therapy, medication, or both to control symptoms. It's important to go to scheduled appointments and take medication as the doctor prescribes. Treatment can take time and a person may not feel better right away. Antidepressants can take several weeks to work, and many people benefit from long-term psychotherapy. Some people with depression find that the following will help manage their symptoms. Exercise, which can be effective as a medication in some cases. Spending time with supportive friends or loved ones. Abstaining from alcohol or illicit drugs. Trying stress management techniques like yoga or journaling. Avoiding taking herbs or supplements without talking to your doctor as some may interfere with antidepressants. Breaking significant tasks down into smaller ones and only doing those that are a priority. If a friend or loved one is showing symptoms of depression, a person can help by asking them to see their doctor or another healthcare professional and helping them make the appointment offering support, understanding, and validation, continuing to invite them to events and outings, reducing stressors at home or at work, helping them eat well and spending time with them outdoors. So now that we know how to identify it and what to do to start treating it, let's move on to slowing the pendulum down. As Jennifer mentioned, you can have sad days and not be clinically depressed. So many factors combine to determine our moods and our abilities to effectively manage them. Think about all the stages, all the different things that come into play, like 
our age. Learning and growing, striking out on our own, trying to make ends meet can be scary and overwhelming. I remember when I unlatched from my family and was finally flying solo. Oh, I thought I knew everything. I wanted to be the boss and make all my own decisions until the first hiccup. And then I wanted to run back to the nest. Being responsible is terrifying when you are first starting out. What about managing life, love, work, and family? Holy cow, there's only so much time in the day, and it feels like we spend most of it at work. Everyone wants something from you, and at the same time, so many plates spinning and you're petrified that you'll drop one and that the people will figure out that you don't really have it all together. Then the kids move out. The house is empty. No one is asking questions or consulting you when big decisions are made. New blood comes into your workplace and you feel less important. Your thoughts and ideas are old school. Everyone's making plans to slow down, but you don't feel accomplished yet. Where did the time go? You're old. How in the world did this happen? Looking back, it feels like it happened overnight. When you were young, you thought about this day, but it felt like forever away, and now you're here. Your nine to five has come to an end. You have all the time in the world to do something cool, but what? You don't feel as good or as motivated as you once did. All you wanted was some peace and quiet, and now you have an endless supply, and it's lonely. You remember when you couldn't find an hour of free time in your schedule, and now you wish you could find an hour of fun and togetherness. No matter where you are in your life, your perspective is everything. Hope is the first syllable of hopeless. So let's focus on turning things around and sending that pendulum back the other way. gives us nine things to do if you feel hopeless in her article for verywellmind.com. Feeling stuck in a place of hopelessness makes life really tough. Fortunately, there are some things you can do when you feel hopeless to make life a bit better, no matter how bad things might seem. Consider that your brain might be lying to you. Your brain might be telling you things that are awful, horrible, and dreadful, It may try to convince you that you can't succeed or tell you that there's no chance things are going to get better. But just because you think it doesn't mean it's true. Your thoughts may be distorted, inaccurate, or just downright wrong. Hopeless feelings fuel hopeless thoughts, and it's easy to get caught up in a negative cycle that makes it hard to see that things can get better. You might even think things like, I've tried everything already and nothing works. But that's probably a cognitive distortion. You may have tried a few things or even 10 things, but you likely haven't tried everything. At least be open to the idea that the way you're thinking may not be accurate. There may be more hope than you imagine. Argue the opposite. When you feel hopeless, You'll likely think about the reasons why nothing will ever get better. So take a few minutes to argue the opposite. What's the evidence that things might work out better than you expect? Or how might things actually get better? Thinking a bit about the potential positives can open you up to more possibilities. And while there's a chance that things might not turn out great, there's also a chance that they might not turn out as bad or stay as bad as you're anticipating. Arguing the opposite might just open your brain up to the idea that things may not be as gloomy as you're anticipating. Think about what you gain from being hopeless. Thinking about what you gain from being hopeless sounds like a strange exercise on the surface. After all, you might be thinking, I don't gain anything. I don't want to feel this way, but 
Upon a little more reflection, you might discover that feeling hopeless protects you from being disappointed. If you don't expect anything good to happen, you don't have to worry about being disappointed if things go poorly. Being hopeless also might help you feel all right about not taking action. Think about it. If you're hopeless that you'll never pay off your debt, you might not bother trying to increase your income by getting another job, or you might not manage your spending by creating a budget. So consider whether you might be gaining something by remaining hopeless. You might find it somehow protects you from creating change or doing anything differently. Consider what you could gain from developing hope. On the flip side, if you become more hopeful, how might your life change? What would you be doing differently if you had hope? Then you might go ahead and start acting as if you were hopeful. You might realize that if you had hope, you'd be going out and meeting new people, or you'd be applying for a new job. Sometimes you have to change your behavior first, and then the feelings might follow. So if you act hopeful, you might start eventually feeling more hopeful. Engage in problem solving. Hopelessness, by definition, is the belief that things aren't going to get better or that you can't succeed. But there's always something you can do to solve a problem or to change how you feel about the problem. Spend some time thinking about potential solutions to the problem. Brainstorm ideas and keep them in mind. You don't even necessarily need good ideas. Just see if you can come up with as many strategies as you can to address a problem. If you can't solve the problem, like in the case of a loved one's illness, consider how to change how you feel about the problem. Could spending time with family members help you feel a little better? Might you feel a little more hopeful if you took a mental health day from the workplace? There's always something you can do to make things a little better or to help yourself feel a little better. Talk to a trusted friend or family member. When you're struggling to identify possible solutions or you are having a hard time getting unstuck, reach out to a trusted friend or family member. Tell them what you're experiencing. This may be able to help you see things from a different perspective, or they may offer strategies that can help you feel better. It can be hard to tell people what you're going through. However, telling someone could be key to helping you gain a little more hope about your situation. Develop a plan. After you've developed ideas by yourself or with someone else, create a plan. Decide what step you're going to do first. Keep in mind that if plan A doesn't work, you always have plan B. Think of your plan as an experiment and your job is to run as many experiments as you can until you discover what works. Take action. Once you have a plan in place, it's important to take action. After all, you likely won't gain hope about your situation by sitting still. Instead, you'll gain more hope when you start putting yourself out there and start seeing what you can do. I love the idea of arguing the opposite. You could also think about pushing back or challenging your current way of thinking. Give this some real thought and where else could you apply this strategy? We're so quick to accept life as it is with a these are the cards I've been dealt kind of attitude. Without sounding too confrontational, what the heck? It's time to confront that attitude right now. Hopeless, having no expectation of good or success. Nope, not today. There is always hope. This is from Daniel Kopka. I've learned from life that sometimes the darkest times can bring us to the brightest places that our most painful struggles can grant us the most necessary growth, and that the most heartbreaking losses of friendship and love can make room for the most wonderful people. I've learned that what seems like a curse at the moment can actually be a blessing. 
and that what seems like the end of the road is actually just the discovery that we are meant to travel down a different path. I've learned that no matter how difficult things seem, there is always hope. And I've learned that no matter how powerless we feel or how horrible things seem, we can't give up. We have to keep going. Even when it's scary, even when all of our strength seems gone, and we have to keep picking ourselves back up and moving forward. Because whatever we're battling in the moment, it will pass. And we will make it through. We've made it this far. We can make it through whatever comes next. Okay, are you ready? Hands and feet inside the rides at all times. How to be happy again. Tips to rediscover your happiness found at aconsciousrethink.com. Isn't it about time you were happy again? You've been asking that same thing for a while, but something has been standing in your way. You just can't seem to find your way back to happiness. Now, it's true that no one can be happy all the time. That's just unrealistic. What you can aim for is a life that contains regular happy moments among the more mundane and even downbeat times. So how do you do this? Well, ask when you stopped being happy. If you want to be happy again, it suggests that you were happy at some point in the past. So the first step is to find that happiness again by asking yourself when you stopped feeling happy. Was it a particular event that jolted your mind out of a relatively upbeat mindset? Did you experience a loss of some sort? The death of a loved one, a breakup, finding yourself out of work, these are just some of the things that can steal happiness away and make it feel hard to find it again. In many such circumstances, you'll have to properly grieve the loss. There's no limit on this. It might take weeks, it might take months, it might even take years before you can regularly experience those happy moments once again. Chances are you'll work your way through various stages of grief until you have reached a point where the loss no longer dominates your thinking. Even then, it might not totally disappear, but it'll fall back into the background and allow you to focus on more positive times. On the other hand, have you found that your level of happiness has been on the slide for some time? Were you once a happy individual who spent many moments enjoying their life and the people and things in it? Do you now struggle to experience these feelings? Can you identify a time when you first notice yourself becoming less happy? Sometimes it's the repetition and drudgery of a day-to-day -day life that wears you down. Time moves forward, but nothing seems to change and you become less content with how your life is. Maybe the aging process brings your ultimate end into focus and you find yourself longing for more. Whatever the cause, if you can figure out when you started to lose your happiness, it can help you discover the right ways to get it back. too hard. In order to be happy again, it's vital that you don't make it your only meaningful goal. There are other things that you can do to create moments of happiness. You cannot and will not always succeed. If you focus too much on happiness as the outcome, you will often find it harder to achieve that outcome. Happiness erupts spontaneously when the conditions are right. If you try to force it, you'll be too caught up in your mind. Your thoughts can help encourage the right conditions for happiness. They are just as likely to prevent it from happening as well. Sometimes the very act of striving to be happy is what stands in the way of happiness. Understand what happiness feels like to you now. One of the reasons why it might seem as though you're not as happy as you once were is because the feeling of happiness 
is not constant throughout life. Happiness is made up of many distinct emotions, and the ingredients of yours might change as you get older. If you don't know what your current recipe for happiness is, you might not do the other things that make you happy. And if you don't equate those individual emotions as being a part of your overall happiness, you won't think of yourself as being happy. For example, when you were young, the excitement and stimulation provided from new experiences can show itself as happiness, both at the time and when you think back on it later. As you grow older, you might begin to appreciate the sharing of tradition with those who are important to you. That's not to say that new things can't make you happy in your later years or that you can't enjoy tradition when you're younger. But the way you feel about things often changes throughout life. So in order to be happy again, you must first figure out what happiness means to you now and what it feels like. Is your happiness closer to contentment and satisfaction? Does appreciation of what you have in your life make you happy? Are you happiest when you have clarity around where you're going in life? Determine the recipe for your happiness and you will be better equipped to fill your life with those right ingredients. Ask what makes you happy now. As we alluded to, what once made you happy might no longer leave you feeling the same way. You have to identify what things you currently enjoy and what you might potentially enjoy given the opportunity. You can't assume these things will be the same things that you used to enjoy. One good way to identify what you do and do not enjoy right now is to spend five minutes at the end of each day thinking about what you've done during the day. For each thing that you've done, ask yourself whether you would want to do it again tomorrow. If you would, it's something that has proved at least some level of happiness. If you would not, perhaps you can avoid doing these things in the future. This can involve asking whether you would wish to spend time with a person again. Tomorrow, if you see them. If after spending time with someone you feel drained or sad or angry or some other negative emotion, you should ask yourself whether this person is someone you need to see as often or at all. The beauty of this end of the day assessment is that you can try new things and then decide how much you'd like to do them again. Perhaps you wouldn't want to do something again the very next day, but you can honestly say that you'd like to experience it at certain intervals. For example, going to a concert may be enjoyable and leave you feeling happy, but it may also involve some level of tiredness, stress, or anxiety from leaving your comfort zone. So you may arrange to go to one every few months, but you wouldn't want to do something like that every day. This can help you in two ways. Firstly, you can be more choosy about which concerts you go to. Secondly, you can decide when to say no to invitations from other people. So not only is it about working on what makes you happy, but also what combinations of things and at what intervals would make it most enjoyable. Over time, you'll discover what matters most to you and learn to prioritize those things to maximize your happiness. You may discover a passion along the way, one that you would be happy to do every single day. And you may not. You may just find a way to fill your life with the right balance of things to bring about the emotions that make up your happiness at the present time. What about asking what is preventing your happiness? Just as there are things that make you feel happy, there are things that stand in the way of your happiness. This can be a mindset. It might be a situation that you find yourself in. It might be a person in your life. It might be an event from your past. Self-assessment can once again be used to identify those things that are preventing you from being happy. One technique can be used to watch your thoughts. Though it's not a hard rule, thoughts that return again and again are often those relating to events that are troubling us. You know, the ones we ruminate about. We tend to experience happiness 
in the present moment. And while we may think back with fondness at a later date, the memories don't live at that forefront of our minds. So by watching your thoughts, you'll be able to pinpoint the situations that are bringing you down and standing in a way of your happiness. Journaling can be very helpful in this regard. It provides a record of what you've done and what you've thought and how you've felt that can be looked at over time to discover patterns. If you notice that a particular thing is causing you unhappiness on a regular basis, perhaps there is a way to solve that. Understand that hardship is a part of life. As much as you try to rid your life of all those things that prevent your happiness, it's better to accept that life will stink sometimes. Hardship and adversity come to us at all various points in our lives. You may struggle to be happy during these times. We cannot entirely avoid them. In terms of being happy again, it's sometimes a case of riding out the storm and doing whatever is in your power to bring it to an end. By accepting that life has taken a turn for the worse and not living in denial, we hasten to return to normality. As much as we wish them away at times, these moments of hardship often shape our character and make us into the resilient people that we want to be. Always take care of yourself. If your body, mind, and soul are not properly nourished and cared for, you won't be as happy as you can, no matter what positive event occurs in your life. An effective self-care regimen also makes it easier to endure the hard times. When you feel healthy, you're able to extract every last drop of goodness and happiness out of a situation. Self-care involves anything that improves the state of your body, mind, and soul. Some of the top priorities should be good sleep, regular exercise, and a diet that is high in nutritious foods. We all know that. I mean, it's common sense. But you also take care of yourself by limiting your use of social media, engaging in a creative pastime, and sitting in a peaceful corner of nature. Even something as small as maintaining good posture while sitting will benefit you by reducing the risk of aches and pains in your neck and back. To be happy again, you must look after yourself. Take control of your brain chemistry. Your happiness is not just a mental concept. It's a physical change in your brain too. Dopamine, serotonin, and endorphins are all chemicals that can be released by the brain in response to a situation. They have various roles, but each can play a part in creating a positive mood in a person. If you learn which activities can cause a release of these chemicals, you can influence how you feel. Let go of control. One obstacle to happiness is the need to control every detail of your life. Yes, you need to take responsibility for your actions, but you also need to understand that many things are out of your hands. By holding on to the idea of control, you give yourself a reason to be unhappy when things don't pan out exactly how you intended. If you could only accept that you guide the outcome but cannot dictate it, you will be better placed to celebrate all the positive things that happen. Your mind can be positive or it can be negative. It's hard to experience both feelings at the same time. Seeking full control leads to a negative outlook. Relaxing into how things turn out encourages a more positive outlook. Let go of perfection. There's no perfect moment in which to be happy. Perfection is unattainable. No person, no event, no thing is ever perfect. If you expect perfection, you simply don't allow yourself to be happy when something good, even something very good, occurs. Are you ready for the top 10 highlights of the show? Number one, remember, there is understanding to be had, responsibility to be claimed, and new ideas to embrace. Number two, many factors combine to determine our moods and our abilities to effectively manage them. Number three, 
No matter where you are in your life, your perspective is everything. Number four, just because you think it doesn't mean it's true. Your thoughts may be distorted, inaccurate, or downright wrong. Number five, arguing the opposite might just open your brain up to the ideas that things may not be as gloomy as you're anticipating. Number six, sometimes you have to change your behavior first and the feelings might follow. Number seven, there's always something you can do to make things a little better or to help yourself feel a little better. Number eight, I've learned from life that sometimes the darkest times can bring us to the brightest places. Number nine, sometimes the very act of striving to be happy is what stands in the way of your happiness. And number 10, when you feel healthy, you're able to extract every last drop of goodness and happiness out of a situation. If you want to share Encouragementology with a friend who needs to know they are not alone in this journey of self-discovery, You can visit EncouragementOlogy.com or anywhere you stream your content to receive this episode and all others. Follow us on Facebook for additional encouragement throughout the week. So I challenge you, recognize the swing of the pendulum and take action on finding the root of the problem. Argue the opposite as you push back on old perceptions, embracing new perspectives. Remember, you can make it through whatever comes next. I know you can do it. Thank you for listening to Encouragementology with Kendall Boyson, where we find positive ways to handle some of life's challenges. Someone's through until the past was clear.